Hi all. In the last three videos, we learned about glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport system. Together, these processes are known as cellular respiration. In the last video, we saw that atmospheric oxygen, O2, can act as the final electron acceptor, the electron garbage can, at the end of the electron transport chain. We call this form of cellular respiration aerobic respiration. The fact that we specify oxygen requiring respiration as aerobic respiration means there must be other kinds of respiration processes. We call these non-O2 utilizing forms of respiration anaerobic respiration. Note, our textbook is wrong about anaerobic respiration, and so are a whole bunch of websites. Our textbook says, how is this done? Some living systems can use organic molecules to regenerate NAD plus from NADH and collectively referred to as fermentation. In contrast, some living systems use an inorganic molecule as a final electron acceptor. Both methods are a type of anaerobic cellular respiration. That last part, both methods are a type of anaerobic cellular respiration, is wrong. Fermentation does not involve the electron transport system, or the citric acid cycle, and is therefore not a form of cellular respiration. If you take microbiology, you'll learn about this more. So let's get that straight right now. Anaerobic respiration is a form of cellular respiration. That means it involves glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport system. But atmospheric oxygen is not used as the final electron acceptor. Instead, some other oxidizing compound, a molecule that readily takes up electrons, is used as the final electron acceptor. Here I show diatomic sulfur, S2, as the electron acceptor, and H2S, rather than H2O, as the product. Anaerobic respiration is only found among prokaryotic organisms, so we're looking at the prokaryotic plasma membrane, not the mitochondrial membranes. The precise processes of anaerobic respiration vary depending on the microorganism and on the molecule used as the final electron acceptor. This has impact on the citric acid cycle. Not all of the electron taxis, NADHs and FADH2s, may be formed, and on the electron transport system, not all of the H plus ions may be pumped across the membrane. To summarize, first, anaerobic respiration occurs only among some prokaryotes. Salmonella is one of those. When it contaminates eggs and performs anaerobic respiration, it produces, produces hydrogen sulfide, H2S, like shown on the previous slide. That is the gas that causes rotten eggs to smell so bad. Other organisms that perform anaerobic respiration are clostridium bacteria, some of which cause botulism and tetanus. Since the citric acid cycle and the electron transport system typically do not run to completion, the ATP production from anaerobic respiration is typically lower than for aerobic respiration. Here we'll say the range is 28 to 32 ATPs per glucose. Still a fairly high number. By contrast, another type of anaerobic metabolism is fermentation. Again, fermentation is not a type of anaerobic respiration because it does not involve the electron transport system. This slide shows lactic acid fermentation. This is an example of what human muscle cells do if they do not have access to O2. The next slide shows ethanol fermentation, the type of fermentation performed by brewers and baker's yeast, Saccharomyces. This is a two-step process, requiring two enzymes rather than the one enzyme process of lactic acid fermentation shown in the previous picture. This shows that there are different forms of fermentation, each reliant on its own particular enzymes. Lots of foods and beverages are produced using many different forms of fermentation performed by various types of microorganisms. Regardless of what type of fermentation we're looking at, two things are always the same. First, pyruvate from glycolysis is always the starting reactant, and second, electrons from NADH are always used. This frees up empty taxis NAD+, and those NAD molecules are then available to use in another round of glycolysis. And when that next glucose is broken down, another two ATPs are produced, and the empty NAD taxis are loaded up again to form NADH. If fermentation occurs again, the NAD plus, uh, 
the NAD plus taxis are emptied and ready to work in glycolysis again. And if this keeps going on, two ATPs will be produced for each glucose that is split into pyruvates. Glycolysis and fermentation occur in the cytoplasm of any cell that performs those functions. And the ATP production is very low, only two ATPs from glycolysis for each glucose broken down. Glycolysis and fermentation is up to 19 times less efficient than aerobic respiration. This amount of ATP is not enough to keep complex human muscle cell activity going for very long, which is why we tire out and can't go very far if we run as fast as we can. Little microorganisms like bacteria and yeast have lower energy requirements and many of them can survive and reproduce just fine solely, solely on fermentation. So that's it for our discussion of metabolism. All of the chemical reactions that go on in the life of a cell and for energy metabolism. Those chemical reactions involved in the production and use of ATP. These are fundamental processes necessary to keep a cell alive. In the next chapters, We'll discuss the processes of cellular reproduction, processes necessary to keep organisms going over long, long periods of time.